we used to be UX UI design as a program offered at Flatiron School, and we pivoted to product design. And I think that threw some of our potential students for a loop. Uh, in your own words, can you talk about what the core function of a product design product designer is to a company? Yeah. Well, first of all, product design encapsulates uh, elements from both UX and UI, but it also extends it. It brings the designer into the business part uh, of the company and helps them think strategically about the features, products, offerings, and customer experience and touch points uh, that that company has. So product designers often specialize in certain areas. So we might have a product designer who is very focused on early customer touch points. So doing surveys and research, right? Making recommendations to uh, sales teams, marketing teams, working in that capacity. And then six months later, that designer may jump over to a different project where they are doing high fidelity mockups and designs for the company's mobile app, right? They may be doing customer journey artifacts, maybe doing usability testing. So a product designer is very versatile in that regard. Oftentimes they will have deeper expertise in some areas than others, but that very flexibility gives companies an edge because they've got a designer who can add value in all kinds of different places. They can quickly get oriented in a new domain, a new technology, a new strategy, right? So I think what we're seeing with product designers is, uh, again, in the top 10 or 20% of tech companies out there, product designers are playing a really pivotal role across the entire organization, not just in you know, the customer offering or product, right? It's the rising tide that lifts all boats kind of mentality where they can jump in and add value in all of these different places, whether it's strategy, whether it's research, whether it's shipping high fidelity final designs. It makes them a great collaborator. It makes them a great partner uh, for cross-functional teams, uh, especially in tech. So it sounds like product designers, it's an advantage to be sort of a jack of all trades then. Yeah, I think there's such a range of like skills and methods that we teach in the program. Uh, it's inevitable that students are going to want to dive deeper into some certain areas than others, right? So any kind of technology, whether it's you know financial tech, whether it's health tech, uh, you know whatever it is, it always has its sort of set of methods, it, its set of, um, you know, design specializations that students can deep dive into. So, for instance, we have some students coming in really fascinated with, like, the future of AR and VR. So we can give them an opportunity to do deeper dive projects into technologies like that. Or maybe we have a student who's really, really interested in financial tech and Bitcoin. So they can choose to take on a project that like highlights their particular passion and gives them uh, time to practice those skills that will be important in that particular domain. So I think that's what's really cool about product design in general is that you can really take your passions and your experience and leverage that uh, into pivoting into a career in, uh, in tech and design. So with that being said then, and this is kind of leading the witness with this question, but pretty much anybody- we Teach you not to do that, by the way, in the program. Yes, 100%. 100%. <laughs> when you're doing user interviews, you can't lead the witness. You yeah. can't bias the interview. <laughs> but exactly. go ahead. Yeah, no, that's real though. So uh, we're a career changing organization. Do you think pretty much anybody can pivot into product design because your past experience is so valuable? And if so, what are some of those questions that someone considering this career change should be asking to asking themselves to make sure that this is the right move and they are a good fit for um, for the program. Yeah, well, there's a lot of questions that um, I think a potential student or someone interested in design should be asking. First of all, like 
are you comfortable with ambiguity? So the most successful designers are those who uh, thrive in ambiguous situations and they don't need an immediate answer. Okay. But what we teach you is the skills and methods to do credible research, to go out and reduce ambiguity, reduce risk, find those answers that you need and orient among different perspectives and try to find a good solution to the problem. We don't always find the best solution. Sometimes the best solution is not an option, right? Mm. So working within those constraints, how can we get to good? How can we get good solutions? And you have to maintain uh, a sense of balance in that ambiguity. So if you really like, you know, quick solutions, quick answers, quick fixes, uh, you, you might have trouble uh, initially getting into design, but if you can thrive in ambiguity and you like holding options open until it's time to make the best decision and hold those options and then triangulate among the different options, then, and, and typically people who are really curious, like just curiosity driven. Yeah. Wow. Designers really are just a curious bunch. We always want to know like, why, why does this work the way it is? Who said it had to be that way, right? Is it just an assumption that, you know, some VP of product said this five years ago and that's just how we do things now? Right. Like, let's question those assumptions. Let's see if this is really the best way forward. Um, I also think people who are interested in the future of technology and anything else. So it might be the future of tech and education, yeah. or the future of tech and banking, the future yeah. of tech and healthcare, the future of tech and cancer treatments. The, like, the list goes on and on, right? Yeah. So if you are fascinated by the potential of technology to do good in the world and to help people, design is right in the middle of that conversation. Uh, this is kind of a whole pivot area we could get into if we want to talk about, uh, you know, ethical design and inclusive yeah. design and those things. But uh, yeah. I'd say to answer that question, I think curiosity, are you driven? Are you by nature a curious person? And uh, are you okay with not getting like a concrete answer quickly? Yeah. Because a lot of those design projects, you know, you go a long time doing research and trying to find the answer. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And it's it's similar to what other designers have said. Curiosity being like probably probably like the most like the most innate and useful of those skills because curiosity can take you down so many different rabbit holes and and um and that quest for learning is super important. I I also wonder like from a teach from a design teacher ex experience perspective when you're looking at potential students or when you're looking at students rather and they're coming up with projects you're looking at the way they think what's a quality maybe that, that stands out to you from a student where you're like I think this person has what it takes to not only obviously just do the program get a job but actually excel in a career in design mm. So talking about hard skills and soft skills is a little bit of a um, simplistic way of thinking about it, but it's a helpful model maybe for structuring a conversation to that question. Um, for someone to really like rise to the top and thrive um, would require them to be a leader. And some of the best product designers end up becoming leaders on their teams, for their company, for their service, whatever it is. Um, so there are certain qualities, leadership qualities that like any skill, whether it's typography or running a usability test, like leadership skills can be exercised. And in our program, we know that hiring managers 
uh, in a competitive market are looking for candidates that exhibit certain emotional, intelligent qualities, certain leadership qualities, certain communication qualities, certain ways of presenting yourself, speaking, uh, collaboration qualities. So these have been lumped into you know, soft skills, right. but yet hiring managers are now really like screening for these things and looking for candidates that have these qualities. And so the great thing about this experience through the course, 15 weeks going through research, UX, UI, uh, you know, ethical and inclusive and accessible design, um, web design, app design, all of these things is it's really kind of putting you in this like boiling room which sounds like it has a negative connotation, <laughs> but what it's doing is giving you the chance to like intimately collaborate with other instructors, with other cohort mates, uh, you know, with portfolio reviews, hiring managers looking at your portfolio. You can cross collaborate with other um, disciplines, with software engineers, data scientists. So we have this really, really interesting, I think, place at Flatiron School where you have all of these disciplines coming together and having interesting conversations about the future of design, software engineering, data science, cybersecurity, and X, you know, whatever X is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do think like leadership qualities uh, help you if you if you're interested in developing that and becoming a better communicator, a better collaborator, yeah. someone who um, exhibits qualities of like emotional intelligence and that other people are willing to like listen to and follow your lead on things, then that will really help you uh, in your product design career. Because even if you're not like a manager of a team, those qualities help you in your career anyway. So it's not necessarily yeah. about being a manager or a team lead yeah. it's about being effective in your role wherever that is and all yeah. of those qualities help that couldn't agree more with the emotional intelligence side could not agree more um our flat iron schools product designer or design head of design um he mentioned empathy being the most important of the qualities that you need to be a, a designer and when i think about the experience that i've had with particular products or um, or even just like going to a store or something like that, or a hotel, you think of that entire experience. Some of them have been, well, I'll say that they have been bad, but what it feels like is there is a lack of empathy on what I have to endure as a consumer. On the flip side, I think of some of the products and services that I enjoy the most and off the top of my head, the, the one that really comes to mind is Apple. And feel free to argue with me that that I think of all the big tech companies, I see them as the as sort of like head and shoulders above everyone else in terms of, excuse me, not only their design, but just the the intent of all of their products. It feels like there's a a strong intent that you can that's almost palpable as you're interacting with the products, with the website, um, with going to like the Genius Bar or something like that. When you look at companies right now, one, as a designer, do you nitpick at everything? <laughs> Is it just like an automatic thing for you? Um, and two, what do you see companies get right a lot of the times and what do you see them get wrong way too often? Yes, I certainly do nitpick. Uh, <laughs> I figured you'd say that. I, I knew. <laughs> it's impossible not to. But I also know how hard it is to get right. Mm. I also know that there's a lot of companies out there that, you know, don't have the teams to do proper research, to do proper customer and user experience design. Um. And even companies that do have the teams and resources may not have the design leadership that can execute at that level. Yeah. Um, that we are becoming more and more used to. So it's interesting when you're talking about Apple because you said a word that I think is telling. You said it feels like this or it feels mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that the best products and the best services also give you like an emotional experience. Yeah. And I think that product designers, again, being versatile, take a little bit from marketing, take a little bit from human psychology, take a little bit from human computer interaction, take a little bit from history and uh, um, even a little bit from like software engineering and programming and a little bit from, you know, art and visual composition and graphic design. And to get to that place with a product or company where it has that emotional resonance, where it becomes, it speaks to like your identity with who you are as a person. Like I am the type of person who uses an Apple product. I am the type of person who uses this software. I appreciate the curation uh, effect that this software gives me. I think to accomplish that, you have to deeply understand who your customers are. Yeah. Yeah. And to deeply understand that uh, requires like, yeah, a, a really, really good design team. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do with the program it, it, it is, is put those people out there in companies who can really make those changes and make the difference for uh for a business or service and help them be competitive, help them rise above, you know, just the rise above the fray. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, the emotional part, I've always said this about Flatiron School, that this decision to come to Flatiron School is an emotional decision as much as, as it is in a logistical one. I even compared it to like when I went to go buy a car and the moment I walked into the dealership and I had been to like five dealerships prior and the car that I saw first, I said, I'm leaving with that car. I want that car. Didn't look at the price tag. Didn't look at anything. What I said is I want that. And I will, I'm now emotionally committed. I yeah. will now find a way to, to handle the payments logistically after. Right, but I'm bought You'll in. Justify the first. behavior based on the emotional like attachment. You'll find reasons to justify yep. that that's the right pick for you. Just like I'll find reasons to justify, you know, spending three thousand dollars on a new MacBook Pro or something every couple of years, right. even though my other one is like chugging along just fine. <laughs> but yeah. but that brings up a, a good point too. Is like there's always the inverse of something. There's always the opposite of something. So as like successful as some of these you know favorite products and companies are part of its clever marketing right and really good marketing right i don't mean clever in a derogatory way right good marketing good branding uh time like companies like apple like they've yeah. had so much time to get this right 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 there's also the inverse of that is like some of these things are also harmful mm. um so you think about uh notifications and the sort of dopamine hit that we're all constantly trying to get like those things are designed like there's a there's a saying that I, I like to use with students a lot and it's the opposite of good design isn't no design it's bad design so what that means is the choices that some companies are making to hijack right? The reward centers of our brains right? Uh, to, to use fear of missing out FOMO or, or to use scarcity effect, which is, you see it like hotel websites going soon. There's only one out right. of 27 left, like right. 10 people are looking at this car. <laughs> so yeah, it, yeah, right? yeah. Those things uh, are designed intentionally. So some product designer or a product manager. I don't know who, right? But um, they're intentionally hijacking those things. So there's always like the flip side of things. And this is where I think our program is unique in that week one, you're getting into ethical design practices and not just in a performative way of like, we should all practice ethical design. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. How do I do that? Yeah. And so we look at like some different frameworks that you can do for risk assessment uh, and harm analysis to make sure that 
you're looking at who's represented in your research. If you go out and survey, uh, you know, a hundred middle-class white people and then look at the results of that survey and say, well, here's our customers, then you're going to be making choices that only benefit the hundred middle-class white people that you surveyed. Right. So who's represented in the research by who are we omitting from the research who could potentially be harmed if their voice isn't there? Right. right? What are we not looking at? What are we not considering? What future effects are we not aware of? And what, que- what questions do we not even know to ask right now? Yeah. So it's that curiosity thing, right? It, mm-hmm. it, it's it's that's what really makes designers an interesting bunch is because yeah. the curiosity is constantly driving us to try to connect the dots that seem disconnected. Yeah. Uh, the the thing that's interesting about that then is when you make a decision to if you go to a company as a designer and they're talking about adding a potential feature that has the potential to make the company X amount of revenue. But when you do a deep dive into it, much like you said with that surveying that particular group and not identifying how harmful it can be to pretty much everybody outside of that group. And as a designer, like that puts you at at a little bit of a quandary, right? Because your organization sees this as an opportunity to make money, but you as a dis- ethical designer, or at least wanting to be a, pra- a practice being an, an ethical designer, you're seeing this as counter to your morale, right? Mm-hmm. Your morality as a person. So how do you, how do you balance those two? I mean, it's a, it's a loaded and difficult question, but like, how do you balance that? Because I'm sure a, a ton of companies, companies won't publicly say it, but they obviously companies have done things that are good for some, and bad for a lot in the sake of making money. How do you navigate yeah. that as a professional? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of <laughs> there's a couple of different angles at play here, right? I mean, it's easy to say these things when like you have a good job in tech and you have those type of choices made available to you. Right. Not everyone has the type of choices that we have. Some people just need a job. Right. Right. And are excited to get into it in any way possible. Right. What I like to do is sort of back away from the sort of morality part of it and just talk about the business part of it. Because that's something that like stakeholders uh, and cross disciplinary teams can kind of get around. They can rally around that. So instead of looking at it as like a morality thing and trying to argue from a place of, you know, it's not moral to send our users notifications that make it seem like they're going to miss, you know, whatever opportunity or whatever. I like to think about it as like, what are we opening ourselves up to in terms of risk? So there's a case study from, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, and many people might be familiar with it, but like Domino's Pizza, uh, their website was not accessible to uh, certain people with um, cognitive and uh, visual and maybe even auditory, I can't remember, impairments. So it was not an accessible website. Yeah, People with impairments could not order pizza using their new tool. And they had invested you know, mil- hundreds of thousands, if not a million dollars into rolling out this new pizza tracker tool or whatever it was. Yep. Well, enough people wanted Domino's Pizza <laughs> that they... Uh, got together and they said, well, we're going to sue you and we're going to bring a a lawsuit because you haven't made this service accessible to everyone. And Domino's said, no, we're not going to do it. It's going to cost, I can't remember, I think it was something like 300,000 extra dollars to make it accessible. It wasn't anything like ridiculous for a company like Domino's. Right. Uh, But they said, we're not going to do it. They were okay. Whoever the stakeholders were in that decision were okay with saying there is a group of people out there that our services are not for, you know, they're not represented in our values as a business. Now, no one said that explicitly, I'm sure. Right. But that was the brand hit. That was the sort of perception of what was going on. Right. Well, anyway, they, they lost, I think the, the, the case, or at least they ended up doing it is all I know of the outcome. They ended up having being forced to make their site accessible and inclusive to all user types. And 
I mean, the money it would have cost to just do it from the beginning yeah. was nothing compared to probably the brand trust percept or the loss of brand trust yeah. and perce- public perception that yep. went in that. So I, I, I talk about some of these decisions in those terms of like, do we really know what risk we're opening ourselves up to by making some of these decisions or by not doing due diligence in the research part of this. And this is why it's so important to do like really good, credible research and make your findings transparent yeah. to the whole business. Because if they don't know, they don't know, right? They don't know yeah, what they yeah, don't yeah. know a lot of times. So I like to think that yes, designers do have an ethical responsibility to like ask these questions, at least ask the questions like as the first thing. And that can do a lot. That can get the conversation started. Yeah, I agree. and. Uh, I think it was Huli who I sat down with. She said, when you present data like that, it's it's the common language of the business. It's hard yeah. to argue it when you when you present it like that. And I think it might be hard for folks to like wrap around their mind that uh, they have to like exclude their morality and and present a business case as to why things need to to be a certain way. But it's it's Fortunately or unfortunately, it's just a reality of that's the language that businesses speak. So I agree 100%. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, I, it's also an opportunity for innovation. Like it, it's it's not, um, there are certain things like, okay, well, like take um, text messaging. Text messaging started out as an accessibility feature. Uh, I want to say like back in the 80s or, or something like oh, that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Was it, it all had to do with uh, accessibility, and now like it's a common feature. Right. Um, think about closed captions, right? Like I use closed captions all the time. I don't Me have an auditory impairment, but like I use it all the time for Me things. Too. So there's all kind of ways that like thinking about how to make sure our products and services work for anyone, yeah. whether you know the impairment or disability is permanent temporary or situational. Um, I think Microsoft released a really cool toolkit, um, inclusive design toolkit that talks about how at any point in our lives, you know, every one of us are going to be impaired in some way. Our other, uh, one of our lecturers, our central lecturer, Bonnie, who you should definitely get on the podcast and talk to right now. She, um, she's going to hate me for saying this. She broke her thumb doing yoga. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not sure what kind of yoga she was doing, yeah. but she now has a uh, temporary impairment, right, with using her mouse and keyboard, right, right. And so you don't know what it feels like until you experience something like that, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this product is not for me, mm. Mm. right? I'm excluded from using this tool or this software or getting my pizza that you know i'm it's not for me right and that's just with a temporary or a situational impairment think about people who have permanent impairments and how that's got to feel yeah to be completely excluded and say this isn't for you yeah that no that's a great point and i hope bonnie makes a speedy recovery i did not know about that Um, i do too i need her to use her keyboard (laughs) yeah she's got to probably use the the um the, yeah, the one like because you the, the 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 what is it called? I think it's called like the trackpad. You know the pad that you can use as a yeah yeah yes yeah the external trackpad. mouse. You yeah, you probably ought to use that. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on you uh, and your career. You started out. You went to college for history and mass yeah. communications. How did you pivot from there into into design? Like, what happened once you graduated and? Um, when did you eventually move into design? Yeah, I mean, gosh, that's such a like weird path. Talk about like connecting the dots that are really disconnected. I don't know if I can really square that circle or connect those dots for you in a nice manner. Um, <laughs> but what what I can say, and this gets back to your other question about like, you know, people coming from other careers or with other experience, you know, how, even if you don't think of yourself as like a creative person or you don't feel like your background is in tech or you're not good with computers or anything like that, 
I say that that's kind of like BS because number one, like we need diverse perspectives in design. We need people to uh, be the type of designer who is not like only using Apple products. Like the, right. it's kind of like the, you know, designer trope. It's like, well, yeah, you have an iPhone and you have an iPad and you have yeah, a, yeah, you yeah. Only work on Apple and things like that. Yeah. We need diversity of perspectives to do better in, uh, in tech. Yep. But like my background being in music, uh, mass communications, things like that and media, I, because I like had a musical bent, I learned to see patterns Mm. and hear patterns really early. So I learned to play music by ear. I would sit, um, I would sit in my parents' church. I grew up in like South Alabama, right? So like we were in church all the time and I would hear repeated patterns played like on the piano or I would hear the drums or the things. And it would just like, all of a sudden I was like, well, I can do that. And so I learned to play by ear and I learned to be sensitive to things that were like repeated over and over. Right. And to like recreate those. I was talking with a student a couple of days ago who is in our current uh, cohort and he was a dancer before this, like professional ballet dancer. And I'm talking about how the rhythm and the steps and the movements that mental model like relates to visual composition because we talk about in visual composition, we talk about um, user interfaces having good rhythm, right? So if you're reading an article or you're scanning up and down a page, you can see the headline, you can see the body copy, then you can see the image, then you can see the, um, the caption and, and, and it repeats over and over, right? It has good rhythm. And so when you can see like the individual patterns in visual composition, but then you can also zoom out and see how that pattern makes a whole song or the pattern makes a whole dance. Right. Right. So it's seeing the whole system, but then also being able to pick out the individual parts, which make out that system. So I think like my background in music helped with that sensitivity. Um, I went through the original boot camp program called designation here in Chicago in 2013 or 14. I don't remember. I was doing like interior design and uh, consulting for interior design then. And a friend of mine said, Hey, a group of designers were starting this design boot camp called designation. And hopefully some people from designation will <laughs> listen to this. And so shout out to them. Yeah. Um, but I was in the second group that went through that, uh, that boot camp, And I mean, I was there for maybe a week before I was like, Oh, this is the future. This is like bringing together the interest in like human behavior and psychology and, and research, marrying that with technology yeah. and also like, running experiments like that curiosity yeah again going back to being curious it's all about like coming up with a hypothesis yeah and then just testing it yeah like so you just get to constantly run these experiments and i think that really like resonated with me it's like hey i can i can not just tell you what i mean and what i think should exist i can create it with like these software programs like with sketch or figma or webflow or adobe xd like the tools have gotten so good that like what's in my mind or what's what's coming from the research, right? I don't just have to draw it. I can like really show you exactly what I'm talking about. And beyond that, I can send it out to a bunch of customers and show you that they love it too. Right. Right. So I I, I really think that's such a cool thing about product design. I get a little giddy and, and childlike about it, but yeah. um, it, it, it all goes back to like, playing Legos as a kid and the first time you could kind of construct a thing that you wanted to be able to use yourself. Like that yeah. just felt like uh, so much power, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can see it and I can yeah. make it and play with it and, and change it. And beyond that, I can invite other people to come in and like play with this cool creation that I've made and I can make, they make it better. Right. That, that's what's so cool, right? Design. It's not just like, 
an alone designer. It's not just me. It's right. a group of people from diverse backgrounds and perspectives making this thing together and making it better together. Yeah, I, I, I completely I felt you with the Legos for real, because that was the first time I I felt like this power to like you could build a kingdom or something. And then, yeah, you then again, you feel this. I felt this when I played. I don't know if you know the the, the game Sims, where you basically yes, like, yeah, yeah, you, oh, you yeah. kind of feel like this ownership of this town, and you get to build it from the ground up. Um, I hear the similar thing with um, people that try software engineering, right? Like they mm. they're like, I interact with these apps and these websites every day. Now I get to put into practice building one uh, of my own. So. After you went to designation, you started your own. You well, you started your uh, your own your own thing a couple times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you you've done you've built a couple businesses, and was that a part of the the goal for you once you left? Because I know you talked about leadership being a really important quality. Was starting your own thing something that you thought of in? in the in the process of learning that you wanted to do yeah do you know i mean the best education is just to like go and start trying to build a thing yeah at the end of the day like a an experience like Flatiron is what it gives you is structure and accountability and a, a, a safe place to like go and build that lego house that you've got in your mind and use like some really cool Legos while you're doing it. Um, so what I did is I tried to learn by doing. And I think there are some places where like you could make a really good career out of that, like independently. But um, so I have ADHD and it's why I jumped around a lot in college uh, because I could never like really settle on one thing. So I've <laughs> attended like four different colleges over the course of like seven years um, and racked up more credits than I could have graduated several times over. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I needed like the structure and accountability to keep me on task because there is a certain amount of like, <sighs> Like, I don't really do any, you know, weightlifting or, any, or <laughs> anything like that. But yeah. I know that there is like a regimen uh -huh. that people get into, right? And yeah. that, that practice and you have to be able to, whether it's running or sports or whatever, like performance at the end of the day. And it's a lot harder to do that completely on your own. Like you can go and Google a bunch of tutorials about weightlifting. I can watch YouTube. I could sign up for a master class. I could sign up for this or for that. Right. But there's just nothing like committing yourself to say, you know what, I'm all in on this. Right. I know this, uh, this course and this company has the tools. They've got the success record to go and, you know, to help me get to where I want to go. So for me, I really needed to say, okay, I've learned a lot doing it on my own, but I've got to now have the accountability and structure every single day to uh, be able to get to the next level. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you've actually taught at designation as well as a as an instructor. What drew you to teaching? What drew you to shaping the young yeah. minds of designers? Well, they're not all young minds, for one thing. That's like, true. We, That's true. We, have, <laughs> we have people that are like on their fifth, sixth, and seventh careers. Um, right. But I know that wasn't the point you were making. Um, what drew me to teach? Well, as soon as I graduated uh, from the boot camp in those early days, uh, I was very lucky to land under two mentors. One was one of the first UX designers for the Obama campaign in 08. So that I know of, Obama was the first president to actually like hire a user experience team. Mm. And he, he was on that team and he worked under a fellow named Jason Kunesh, who used to be the director of design for the city of Chicago. And I, I know Jason and Jason mentored uh, he mentored my mentor. So that's, it's, he's my grandfather mentor, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird way to say it. 
Um, so I was lucky to have a, a UX mentor and coach uh, that I worked under. And then he had a partner who was a director of UI design for this first company that I was in. And I got both worlds of UI and UX, right? Just due to my curiosity, I couldn't just do visual design and prototyping. I couldn't just do wireframing and UX and like pure research. Like I, yeah. I wanted to kind of be in all of the conversations. Um, yeah. And having mentors at the same time for both UX and UI, I think I leveled up really, really fast. Uh, and I think it's only because I had two very strong mentors working with me. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're coming into a program like this, or if you're graduating a program like this, if you really want to like level up quickly, you know, try to find yourself a coach or a mentor. Um, but anyway, back to the teaching part of it. Yeah, I just, I was invited back. And as soon as I stepped back and I saw like the new cohorts, and this was several years later after I you know, graduated and designation yeah. was still running and growing and being very successful. It was like one of the biggest boot camps in the country back then. Yep. Um, they invited me back. And one of the first lectures that I gave was how do you level up quickly? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I realized there was like all these things that all these patterns that I had seen, you know, since leaving the boot camp that like, would be super helpful to know to the current cohort. And I was like, they should know all this. Like yeah. they, they need to hear all of this. This is really going to change, you know, how they approach design. And plus the design world is, you know, constantly changing, right? Like, I mean, it just, things change, trends change and technologies and things like that. And roles change. As you said, at the very beginning, uh, we started with UX designer, UI designer, UX slash UI. And now we're talking about like product designer. So right. that's just in the span of a couple of years. True. So things are changing and we can be comfortable, uh, us designer types in that ambiguity. And we know we can add value in all the different places. But yeah, that um, that brought me back to wanting to uh, wanting to teach, I think, is that very first time I stepped foot back in there and I saw all those new... <laughs> <laughs> fresh yeah. designers and i was like ah oh, i have so much to tell you <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 that's wonderful and i hope you have something good to tell me for this last question because it's the question we ask everybody at the end which is yeah. joshua robinson what is a quote that you live by a quote that i live by <laughs> yeah. i can tell you exactly it, it's not a, it's not going to be the quote um, okay. But it's close enough. I think it's Walt okay. Whitman. Um, mm -hmm. uh, build therefore your own world. Mm. It's the end of a, I think it's the end of a Walt Whitman quote, build therefore your own world. Um, which to me, I always interpret as, you know, like I have a responsibility to be true to myself and true to uh, the people around me um, that I care for the most. And that requires like carving out a space to do that in uh, and to practice those values. And I'm really happy to say that like, especially making the jump into being a designer, um, an individual contributor in both UX design and UI design and product design and research all the way up to now, you know, directing the program here at Flatiron has been true to that uh, build there for your own world um, where like, yes, you always like collaborate with people. You're always learning from people. You're always growing. Um, but you have to find a way to be like true to the values and things that are most important to you. Because when you're not being true to that, uh, you know, you're at odds with yourself, I think. So um, I'm happy to have found a place, uh, a company that supports that and a, a practice and a um, career that, in that often encourages that. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that is the show. Joshua, thank you so much for joining us. And if you made it this far, please hit subscribe, hit like, ring that little notifications button so you know every time we drop. But every Friday, we're here. Um, and please share. Share with your friends. Share with the group chat. Share with your mom, your dad, your dog, everybody, please. And um, that was another episode of the Tech Perspective Podcast. And we are out.